Hey bees, welcome to Guests and Gusto, SCAD's virtual series of conversations and digital content with the creators and innovators remaking culture. I'm Nicole Blackwood, a professor of art history here at SCAD, and we're joined today by photographer Alexei Lebomisky. Alexei became a household name when he was chosen by Kensington Palace to take the official engagement and wedding portraits of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, which generated more than 2 billion views on social media. He's photographed celebrities like Angelina Jolie, Nicole Kidman, and Lupita Lyongo for major publications like Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, GQ, and Elle. He's also shot campaigns for brands like Louis Vuitton and Ralph Lauren. Offset, Alexi is an ambassador for the global humanitarian organization Concern Worldwide. He's also a dedicated vegan and animal rights activist, and he's transforming the fashion and entertainment industries with his initiative Creatives for Change. Alexi also has a fun SCAD connection his, his wife is a former SCAD student and was a member of the soccer team. So let's take a look at the life and work of Alexei Lubromisky. Hi, my name is Alexei Lubromisky. I'm a fashion and portrait photographer. Right, back the other way. Lovely too, yeah. Over the course of my career, I've had the incredible good fortune to work with some of the top magazines in the world, like Harper's Bazaar and Vogue and Elle. I want to share with you all the other parts of my life. For example, I wrote a book for my two sons on fatherly advice that's now been translated into six languages. My mother is Peruvian English and my father is Polish French. And I grew up in between Botswana and Paris and London. And now I live in New York City. And to spice things up, I married a Cuban Italian who also happens to be saving the planet as the eco-shaker. And I'm also a dad. And together, my sons and I wrote a children's book. Did I say I love to travel? I love to travel. I'm also an ambassador for the humanitarian charity called Concern Worldwide. I'm a crazy Virgo who has to have 15 projects going on at the same time. I'm also a super cheesy romantic who loves anything to do with love. Which is why in 2018, when the most in love couple of the year, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, asked me to be the official photographer for their wedding and engagement, I was pretty excited. introduction. Welcome, Alexi. Thanks for joining us. We're so right. excited to hear more about your career and your work for Creatives for Change. I think now more than ever, it's important for artists to create with a conscience. And our students, I think, will really benefit so much from hearing about your work and advocacy. So let's, before we get started, I just want to check in with them uh, with a poll that we have. Uh, so if we can have that list so there you can see. So which Alexei Lebromisky photograph do you want to know the story behind? Is it uh, Selena Gomez, Harry and Meghan, Lupita Lyongo, Leonardo DiCaprio, Brad Pitt, and Quentin Tarantino, or Camille Cabello? So if you get those results in, I will share those later on uh, in the conversation. So, but before, that. So let me choose my selection. Before that, uh, and you'll, if you um, put in your selection, you will have a chance to win Alexi's book, Diverse Beauty. So that's an incentive to get that in. So we'll get to those answers in a moment. But before then, I'd like to just pass the floor over to Alexi. And I think you have a few things that you wanted to share with us, and then we'll open it up for conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for that video. It made me look much more busy than I feel. Um, so basically, uh, I wanted to cover a few things. I usually try and cover the questions that I mostly get asked. Um, so it always starts off with how did you get started? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up a um, PDF that I worked on to make things a bit more interesting. So hopefully you can see that. 
Um, so, uh, how did I get started? I got started out at the University of Brighton in England. I was studying photography. Uh, one day we had a lecturer come in who was a, a photographer from the real world. And he came in to tell us about what the real world was like. And he was so negative. And he was saying to us, he kept waving around this piece of paper saying, out of you 40, only one of you is going to work, maybe two at the most. And everybody on this list is going to reject you. And so, of course, I didn't like what he was saying because it sounded so negative, but I was very curious what was on that paper. So during the break in the, in the lecture, the guy went to the bathroom and I went up to the podium. I took the piece of paper, I photocopied it and put it back and I left the uh, auditor auditorium. And it was basically a, a page of um, a list of all the uh, photography agents, the magazines, uh, addresses, hair and makeup agencies, et cetera, et cetera. So I decided that instead of listening to this guy, I'm going to go to London and I'm going to see everybody on this list. And there was about sort of 75, 80 people on the list. So I, um, I stopped going to college for three weeks so I could work triple shifts at the pub on the beach where I had a job to save enough money so I could go and couch surf uh, for a week uh, in London and go and see everybody on this list. Now, obviously, I didn't know anything about portfolio presentations. So I, I thought to myself, I don't want to be carrying around a big, heavy portfolio. So I'll just photocopy, reduce all of my pictures onto these tiny, tiny pages like this big and put them in a tiny booklet so I can put it in my, my pocket. Obviously, the quality was terrible, but I didn't know that. And um, I went up to London and I saw everybody on that list and everybody slammed the door in my face because, of course, I was just knocking on the door saying, hey, my name is Alexi. Um, I would love to show you my work and so you can tell me what I need to do so you can hire me when I leave college in six months time. So, of course, everybody slammed the door in my face. One young, nice photographer gave me a cup of tea and that was a young starting off photographer called Tim Walker, who's now one of the biggest photographers in the world. And he took me for a coffee and said, listen, you're going about it all wrong. Come back in six months, get a big portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. So after I left him, I got back on the train and I felt so downtrodden and so disheartened. And all I wanted to do was go home and get some Ben and Jerry's ice cream and hide under my duvet and just watch crappy, crappy movies and uh, just cry. But there's one last person on my list. But in order to go and see this person, I would have to go the whole way across London again and then walk another 45 minutes to where her agency was. She was probably going to be shut. But I thought, if I don't do it, I'm going to regret it. So I got off the train, went the whole way there. And it was this woman called Camilla Lowther, who was a photography agent. And she was locking up as I arrived. And she, she sort of took, took pity on this sorry looking, sweaty, bedraggled, depressed looking guy. I showed her my little book and she kind of laughed at it, but she liked the pictures inside. And she said, I think you've got great sense of narrative, but I don't think you're ready to be a photographer. You should be an assistant. And uh, Mario Testino is looking for somebody. So a couple of weeks later, I was meeting Mario Testino and I got the job and I, hang on there again, uh, I worked with him for four years and it was an insane four years of traveling around the world I think we were on a plane on average once every four or five days, um, going from Scotland to Rio to South Africa to Australia to Prague to you name it, we were there. And um, it was incredible because on set you would be talking, you'd have all these amazing people to, sitting next to you. You'd have the Anna Winter, or the Grace Coddingtons, or the top creative director in the world, or the top hair and makeup in the world. And in those days, we didn't have cell phones on set, so people talked to each other. It was really bizarre. And so um, I would uh, talk to people about how they got started. You know, there was a typical thing during a shoot, you'd have um, a lunch break where everybody would sit down at this long table. And all the assistants would go to the far end of the table so they could smoke cigarettes and just not talk to the grown-ups anymore. But if I saw an empty chair next to Grace Collington, I would go and sit next to her and... My mother always said people love talking about themselves, so just ask questions. So I sat down next to them and I poured them wine and because we had wine during lunch in those days. And um, I would ask them how they got started, any advice they had for me, what they thought of the industry, et cetera, et cetera. And I learned so much, I had so many pearls of wisdom. Um, but also when I finally left, they were, they were the ones who sort of remembered me and gave me a chance uh, to try out. Uh, while I was working for Testino, I had zero time to do any tests of my own, which you're supposed to do. You've got to build up a portfolio. Um, so I think in four years, I managed to do about three tests, which is nothing. 
Um, but one of the people that I spoke to who I asked questions of was this woman called Katie Grand, who is the editor-in-chief of uh, Love magazine right now. Back then, she was the editor-in-chief of Face Ma the Face magazine in England, which is an iconic magazine uh, in the 80s and 90s. And I did this test. I had no money for lights. So I got my um, girlfriend at the time to uh, pose for me. And we got a stylist assistant friend of mine to get the clothes. And we went into this dark, darkened out, blacked out bathroom where there's no windows. And because I didn't have any money for lights, I did 20 second exposures. And while my little, my baby brother counted to 20 and I held the shutter down, I would paint light onto the model with this tiny pen torch probably about this big. And I would just paint light into the eyes for 20 seconds, you know, five seconds here, five seconds there. Some on top for a bit of drama, some underneath just so I could see the detail. It was a nightmare because you never know what you were going to get. You didn't know what was going to come out. Um, but uh, thank God, one frame at least from each outfit came out. And I showed this to Katie Grand and she published it in the Face magazine. And that was my first published shoot. And very soon after that, she um, insisted that I leave Mario and go and work with her at Pop Magazine and Face Magazine. And then she took me to Harper's Bazaar Magazine in America. So my career was off and running and uh, I was very, very lucky at the beginning. I got lots of opportunities. I uh, started getting covers very early um, and it was all growing great. So this was around 2004, 2005. So then, Around 2011, I want to skip to, um, I want to talk about how my ethics changed in my work. And so I'm going to switch to a bit of a, a personal story. And it's to do with my stepfather. Um, so this is my stepfather and me through the years. Um, so this is a guy called John, my stepfather, John Mannering. He was the best father figure you could ever hope for. He was God's gift of stepfathers. And uh, in November 2011, he suddenly went to the hospital and um, for a checkup and the doctor came to him and said, listen, you've actually got cancer everywhere. You've got three weeks to live. So as you can imagine, it was a bit of a sort of a massive shock to the family. So we brought him home immediately and so that we could spend the last three weeks together. And my stepfather was a sports freak he was always watching Chelsea football club. He was always had that. He would be on his bed list, uh, watching Chelsea on the football with a radio next to his head, listening to cricket from Australia and reading the paper about uh, rugby. And so I said to him, listen, we're going to get you five TVs up on the wall and we're going to, so you can watch every sport that you love so much. And he said, you know, what's really weird. Don't bother. I don't care about it anymore. And it was very strange, he said, that when you suddenly know you're going to die, and we all know we're going to die, but when you suddenly know you're imminently going to die, all of the things that, you, that were important to you, that you thought were important that, in your life, that you cared about, you were worried about, things like, you know, is Chelsea going to win the FA Cup? Is, uh, does my best friend have a better job than me? Um, is my next one ever go on better holidays than me, et cetera, et cetera. All those silly things you worry about. He said, they all drop away without you trying. And you're left with the two or three things that are really, really important in your life. And for him, that was that he had spent as much time with his kids as possible, that he had loved and he'd been loved. And the last thing was that he'd done charity work in his last few years of his life. And because um, he said it gave him such a sort of sense of perspective and he realized how blessed he was. So um, my family and I, obviously, uh, we were downstairs in the kitchen crying most of the time in shock. And after the second or third day, I went up to him because I'm, I'm always asking questions of people about things. I'm constantly on the search for trying to understand stuff. And I went up to his room and I said, uh, what's, going on, what, what's going on in your head right now? I mean, we're all freaking out. What are you going through right now, knowing that you're going to die so soon and he said you know what's really weird i when i was told by the hospital that i was gonna die i was angry and i was bitter and i was like why why is this happening to me he said but this, the day after i came back home i woke up and i suddenly felt this massive gratitude gratitude that we get to spend three weeks together as a family knowing that i'm gonna die and we're able to say all the things we want to say i wasn't hit by a bus and gone like that 
you know, we get all this time together. Um, and so we spoke about life and death and his life and, you know, being able to speak to somebody at the end of their life is a really unique experience. And so I said, well, you know, now that you know, now that you can look at your whole life in retrospective, what does life mean to you? What is life about? What, is, what do you think we're here for? And so we spoke about it for three weeks. And <clears throat> we came to this conclusion that it's this interesting thing where you arrive with nothing as a spirit or a soul, and you leave with nothing as a spirit as a, as a spirit or a soul. So, and you can't take anything with you. You can't take, you know, your, your fancy car, your fancy clothes, your jewelry, your money, or anything like that. You, you leave with nothing. So with that being said, how do you leave this life richer than when you came into it? How do you enrich your soul? And so we realize that it's about um, evolving and um, re you know, look at realizing your blessings and using those blessings to help other people. And that's how you enrich your soul and evolve. Um, and so that's what, that was the gift that he gave me. He gave me this gift, which I like to call future hindsight. And so after that, I was able to look at life in a very different way. And every decision I made after that was so easy because you suddenly don't worry about stuff anymore. You don't sweat the small stuff. Every decision was based on how am I going to feel about that in, the, in on my deathbed? It might, be, it might sound a bit morbid, but it, it's, it's, um, it's done me wonders. So I went back into, um, into my life and I started doing things that I had never done before because I was always so worried about it or scared about it or worried what people might think. So for example, I, um, I, wrote, uh, I wrote a book for my sons. Um, it was a book of fatherly advice. And you know, I would never have done this kind of stuff beforehand because I would have thought to myself, who, who am I? I'm a fashion photographer. Who am I to write anything to do with advice? What do I know? But I realized that with my new sense of future hindsight, I said to myself, well, at the end, at the end of my life, I'm not going to care about what people think. All I'm trying to do is put a little bit of light, a little bit of love out into the world. Um, it's not a vanity project. It's not supposed to get me any further in my career. So I put it out and it got translated into six languages. It made all the money we went to a humanitarian charity called Concern Worldwide. I think we raised about 40 or $50,000. Um, so it was great, it was a wonderful thing. I also wrote a, a thank you book with my sons about gratitude, uh, which also raised money for charity. And again, I would never have done this kind of stuff beforehand, but then now I just don't care about anything anymore because I realized that on my deathbed, I'm not gonna say, oh, thank God I didn't write that children's book on gratitude, how embarrassing that would have been. I would have been, uh, at the end of my life, I'm going to be like, thank God I wrote that book. Thank God I tried to do something positive in my life. Um, so I started, I went back to work and um, I started to sort of look at the, 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 the details of my work that I'd always questioned before and always felt a bit weird about. One of them being fur. Um, I'd always felt weird about shooting a fur in fashion, but I'd didn't really question it because I thought everybody does it. It's just part of fashion. It's part of the industry. But I went back into work now and I thought to myself, on my deathbed, am I not going to wish that I'd said no to certain things that I felt were wrong? And so I started saying no to, to fur. I remember it, I was offered a very big job uh, for this company called Black Glamour. Now, Black Glamour is this very famous fur company where Everybody has modeled for it over the, the decades. Um, way before other people, other celebrities started modeling for, for fashion labels, they, were, they had like Pavarotti, Elizabeth Taylor, Diana Ross, all these big celebs um, modeled for them. So at the time, um, a, one of the biggest supermodels of the time asked me to photograph her in this campaign. And it was the first time I really thought to myself, this is crunch time. This is sort of a crossroads. Do I, what do I do about this? Because it's not just a few pieces that I'm shooting in an editorial. This is me getting paid a lot of money, more money than I've made before to shoot just fur and to sell it and using my talent to sell more of this. And so I said to my agent, I said, I don't think I can do this. And he said, come on, you're being a hypocrite. Everybody does it. You shoot fur in your, in your editorials um you need this money which i did and but i thought to myself 
this is a crossroads and I have to make a decision. So I said no. And I thought to myself, I'm going to regret this. As soon as I put the phone down, I'm going to, I'm going to be calling him back going, please, please get me the job. But as soon as I put the phone down, I had this massive sense of elation and this lightness and this like this big weight had been taken off my shoulder because I knew that I'd made a very difficult decision, but for the right reason. Um, so I decided from then on, I was going to use my photography diva card because people in the fashion industries, we're a bit divas sometimes. And, um, you know, there's the generations before mine, you know, there's always demands of, I want my own trailer, I want my private jet, I want red M&Ms on set, whatever it is. And I thought, I'm gonna use my diva card, but I'm gonna use it for conscious reasons and for ethical reasons. Um, and of course, my agent said, you're gonna lose lots of jobs because if you say, I don't wanna shoot fur or um, feathers, or we added feathers and exotic skins to it. He said, if you say no to these things, people are gonna stop working with you. But I thought on my deathbed, will I be wishing that I'd done this, you know, said no to this stuff, or will I be happy knowing that I'd just taken the money and just sort of brushed it aside? But I, so I decided to say no, because I want to make sure that in the future I'm looking back on my life and realizing that I was on the right side of the fence. And I lost lots of jobs, but I always had this idea that if I closed certain doors for the right reasons in my life, that other ones would open up. So suffice it to say, my career despite losing lots of jobs, it thrived in different ways. So I started doing really well and I was getting lots of cover photography. I went more towards the celebrity side of things and I realized I was, I was all right today. I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't too shabby. Um, so this was all going great. Everything was wonderful. And then something bigger happened. So it was, um, again, to do with a uh, family illness, rather bizarrely. Uh, my mum in November 2017 had to go into hospital to take a brain tumour out. And the doctor said to us, listen, it's 50-50 chance whether she's going to make it. It's going to be a 10-hour operation. Um, so I flew back to England with my brother and sister. And we were, it was the worst day of my life. You know, you're wandering around the hospital corridors for, for 10 hours and you're wondering about, is she going to make it? You're praying, you're getting coffees, you're getting sandwiches, you're just going nuts. And you're watching the news that's on every TV in the, in the hospital. And the, the news cycle that day was that Harry and Meghan had got engaged, but I didn't really take any notice of it. And I was just freaking out about my mum. So after 10 hours, the doctor was supposed to have called me and uh, he hadn't. After 10 and a half hours, there was still no call. After 11 hours, there was still no call. So my brother and sister and I were panicking. And then the, the phone rings, I pick it up, I say, hello, hello, hello. And there's this voice saying, hi, is that Alexi? Uh, this is Kensington Palace calling. Um, and I was like, sorry, who, who is this again? And he said, it's Kensington Palace, can we talk to you? And I looked around at my brother and sister who were looking at me, freaking out. And then I suddenly remembered that the news cycle of the day about Harry and Meghan getting engaged. And so I thought it must be my friend pranking me. So I was about to unleash blue, language down the phone saying, are you, are you kidding me? It's my mum's operation day. You can't do this to me today. But I kept it together and I took a breath and I said one more time, I'm sorry, who is this one more time? And they said, it's Kensington Palace. We have a project we want to talk to you about. So I said, okay, can I call you back tomorrow on this number? And they said, yes. So I put down the phone. 20 seconds later, or two minutes later, the doctor rang. My mum had survived. So he we went upstairs and the first thing my brother said to, um, my mum, when she woke up, was guess who just called Alexi? Which, of course, she didn't believe a word of it because she was high as a kite on drugs. Um, so uh, two weeks later, we were shooting the, um, the uh, official engagement pictures for Harry and Meghan. And uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful November day. The light was incredible. We had this, it was freezing all day long, but it was great. Um, and then another six months later, we were shooting the royal wedding, which was probably one of the most stressful, crazy, wonderful, surreal days of my career. Um, so obviously this whole royal injection um, gave me a lot more visibility um, within the industry and outside the industry as well. So with my stepfather's words ringing in my head about how do we use our blessings to you know, share the blessings, um, I set up 
an initiative called Creatives for Change. Now, Creatives for Change works on the idea that we are all so lucky to be working in this industry. And if you are a, a creative, whether you're a photographer, a stylist, a designer, a magazine editor, whatever, you have huge power to inspire people with every creative choice that you make. Um, and I wanted to remind creatives of that and say to them, listen, I want you to realize your power and to really think about every time you make a creative choice, is it sending positive ripples out into the world or negative ripples out into the world? Um, and so my first project in the Creators for Change initiative was to ask people to sign a pledge saying they would no longer use fur, feathers or exotic skins in their creative output. And it was fascinating. Some people said, yeah, totally. No, I'm definitely going to sign because I've been waiting for somebody to sort of knock me out of my, my, uh, my numbness. And they signed straight away. Other people didn't sign. And, but it was always interesting to hear their, 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 their reasons. Photographers that I would talk to would say, listen, I will definitely stop using this stuff. As soon as magazines stop asking me to shoot it and they stop putting in the magazines, I'll stop shooting it. So I would go to the magazines and I would say the same thing to the magazines. And they said, we would love to stop, um, you know, putting this stuff in the magazines. But the trouble is that, you know, designers are making it and they pay us advertising. So if they want to put it in our magazines, then we have to put it in. So I went to the designers and the designers said, the public wants it. You know, the public demands it. And if they want it, I, have to, I want to design it for them. So it's this cycle. Now, the trouble is that the public will no longer, will, will not stop demanding this, the, these products until we creatives stop making them look aspirational. So we have to make the choice whether you want to step outside the circle or not. Photographers have to say, I don't want to shoot that. And therefore that thing will not go into the editorial. It will not look, it will not look amazing in this editorial where, because you've got to realize how, in, how impactful editorials can be. You know, you have this gorgeous model standing on a sand dune somewhere. She's got a, big fur coat looking luxurious, luxurious. She's smoking a cigarette and she's got this hair and lipstick and a young impressionable mind will look at it going, oh my God, this image speaks to me somehow. And so if it speaks to me, I must want everything in that picture. I want to smoke, I want to wear that fur coat. I want to <laughs> be on a sand dune <laughs> in a fur coat. Weird, but it's fashion. Um, so, so yeah, so I was trying to remind the creatives of this and saying, listen, you've got to, this is why we stopped smoking cigarettes in advertising, in, in, um, in fashion editorials, because we knew what it was doing. It was making people look cool. And young girls, young men were wanting to look cool. So that's what they did, they smoked cigarettes. So um, I said to you guys, I said to the creatives, listen, we can be the change. It's up to us to make the change. It's up to us to, to, step outside of that, of that box and make a stand. And I try to remind them saying, listen, you, at the end of your life or the end of your career, do you want to look back and think that you made the right choices when, when you had the power? Um, and the, the fact is that we are all in the industry and outside the industry, we're all educated people. You know, we know where stuff is made and we know how it's made. You can't sort of feign ignorance about how fur, feathers and exotic skins are made. You know, they come from animals, Animals get killed, probably. Um, and I think we should, we probably should or would or do all agree that slitting the throats of an animal to get their pelt is not what the words luxury should be attached to. When you think of luxury fashion, it usually applies to things like furs, exotic skins, and feathers which is a very interesting thing, which I think I just want to put that seed inside your head about should we redefine what the word luxury means or do we need the word luxury at all? Um, but I think that we have to sort of really use the knowledge we have and not just ignore that knowledge, but actually sort of take it in and make some decisions, make some tough decisions. It might be tough, might be easy. Um, I do understand that fear is a factor, you know, fear of, losing jobs, losing customers, losing, uh, losing clients. Um, but the fact is, as I remind people, you can't let fear, if you're a creative, which I presume most of you who are watching this are, 
you can't let fear dictate your choices. And the reason that you guys know this more than anybody else in the world is because when you're a creative, you have to make choices that make no sense at all. You make choices, if you're a designer, for example, you're, there's no scientific proof that if you pick this yellow with this pattern and this, uh, on this design that it's going to sell. But sometimes it does because you feel it. You feel something inside you. It's like, this is right. If you're a painter, there's no scientific fact that if you put this kind of color next to this color, it's going to be amazing. It's going to touch people's souls. But you feel it inside. You feel it in your gut. You feel it in your heart, whatever it is. And that's where magic happens in creativity. That magic happens when, you are, when you're scared. You know, when you're scared of like, I think this is right, but I'm not sure because I've never seen this kind of thing before. You've got to go for it because that's when crazy, amazing things happen. That being said, you should use that same mentality when you're making choices for the right reasons, difficult choices, like should we be wearing fur feathers or exotic skins? Um, so you have to listen to your heart when you make creative decisions for the easy things and for the difficult things. Um, and it's really about being a creative with a conscience. Um, you are all the next wave of creatives. I'm saying you all, I'm looking at myself on the screen. Um, you are all create the next wave of creatives. And what I want to ask you is, what path will you follow? What is your legacy going to be? What differences are you going to make? How, how is your creativity going to inspire people? I think these are really important questions to ask yourself, and, and especially at the very beginning of your career, because trust me, it is a lot easier to choose a path at the beginning of your career rather than having to change your path when you're already halfway down your career. It's much easier to do it now. So I really want to sort of instill that idea into you about what are you going to do. Um, now, speaking of what are you going to do, um, we are um, moving into a very weird time right now. Uh, it's very unknown, um, but as I said at the very beginning, I think out of chaos comes opportunity. Um, there's always room for creativity. Um, I think you have to, I've been telling all of my team to use this time when you're in lockdown, use this time to really explore your creative mind. Now, I, I suggest doing this by sitting in silence. <laughs> I don't know, if you meditate, fantastic. Even if you do meditate, try sitting in silence, not meditating, just sit or just be in silence. You know, we, we surround ourselves with music. I mean, I'm the worst offender of it all. I, I'm constantly scared of silence. Uh, up until I met my wife, I would have music on at every single minute of the day, even to the point where when I went to sleep, I had to have music playing in the corner of a room, the lowest volume possible, but I had to hear music because I was so scared of silence, because when silence meant going into my thoughts and having to process my thoughts, and I just didn't want to do it, I just wanted to keep it away. And then my wife came along and she was like, we're not having music in the bedroom. <laughs> so that put pay to that. But um, silence can be the most incredible creative tool because the way I describe it to my team is that, and uh, <laughs> there's no scientific proof this is true. This is my belief. There is a creative ether, a creative energy that surrounds us the whole time. And if you are constantly on Instagram and Facebook and you've got music, music playing, movies and uh, um, streaming, streaming TV programs, and there's no respite. There's no moment of silence of just calm where this creative ether can start dripping ideas into your head. And I 100% know that all of my best ideas have come from silence. And yet I fight it. I still fight it. If I'm taking the dog for a walk, I think, oh, I should listen to a podcast or I should call my mom on FaceTime or something. I have to force myself to not do anything and just be and just let the soundtrack of my day be my thoughts. And it can be the most amazing, amazing productive thing because after you've got through the first minute of like, oh God, I need to look, listen to something or watch something or whatever it is, you just start processing stuff that you've seen all day long. Now imagine you've been on social media all day. When you're swiping through Instagram, 
imagery gives you little micro doses of emotions, emotional reactions, right? So this one might cause you pain, this one might make you feel gushy or hormonal or something. This one might make you feel love, this might make you feel angry. And then you swipe on, you don't give yourself a, a millisecond to process that emotion. So you're storing up all this, 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 this uh, hill of emotions. And you need that silence to process those emotions and then move them out. And then once you move them out, then stuff can move in. Um, it's, uh, like I said, there's no scientific proof, but it's worked for me. Um, also, while you're in this time, research, research, research. I know it can be very difficult when there's no structure to, to, to understand what you should be doing right now. When I was starting off being a photographer, I had you know, no job. I, I said I was lucky at the beginning of my career, as in I was able to work and pay the rent, but I would go for months without a job. And so I'd spend my time going to, because um, there wasn't really Google Images, there probably was Google Images, but I didn't know about it. I would spend my time going to bookshops and to postcard shops and all, you know, vintage poster shops. I go to museums and galleries and go to the bookshops. I didn't have any money for books. So I would take my first generation digital camera. I'd take the books that I liked and I would go to the back of the bookshop and I would sort of sneak a picture of the pages I liked and then put them back on the shelf. Probably illegal. So don't do that. Um, and, um, but what I did is that I, started to build up this library of images that inspired me and when you so what that did is that all of this time on my own with no work i was just putting together shoot ideas you know if i suddenly would had a day of looking at old helmet newton pictures or old avedon pictures or whoever it was and i'd find the ones i liked and i realized that i was picking stuff that had a theme to it so i put all those ones with a theme into a certain file so later on, when I started getting job offers, um, when they called me and said, have you got any ideas? I'd say, yes, I've got an idea straight away. I can send it to you. And so it's very, very important to build up those, those libraries or files, inspiration files, I call it. I've been doing it since I started in 2003. I've now got something like 57,000 images that I have to go through. Um, it's also very, very important, hugely important, Nowadays, when you look at inspiration, because I ask young assistants, I say, where do you get your inspiration from? And they always say Instagram or Pinterest. Now, there's a little problem with this, is that if you're looking at imagery on Pinterest or Instagram, the algorithms are limiting your creative search. So for example, when, in the old days, the old days, when I would go to a bookshop, I would I would not go to an Avedon book or, an, or a Helmut Newton book because I already knew that I liked it. I knew what I was gonna find in there. There's no point going back to the same thing. I go to the other side of the bookshop and find something by an artist I'd never heard of, something where I didn't even like the look of the cover, but I would flick through it anyway. Thinking there's nothing in here I'm gonna like, but you would find one picture where the lighting was incredible or there was some narrative in there or some position or pose that would like blew your mind or just made you feel something. And if I hadn't gone to that book, I would never have found it. Now, the problem with Pinterest and Instagram is that because of the algorithms, the, the compute, the algorithm says, right, that person likes Helmut Newton and uh, um, Avedon. It'll start feeding you the same kind of stuff the whole time. So you'll be going around in circles. You'll get a few variations in there, but you'll start going around a circle. So I highly suggest trying to look at things that you know you're going to hate because within that mess, you will find little pearls of wisdom and little pearls of, of new stuff. Um, what else, what else, what else? Um, oh yeah, so during this time, so apart from researching, um, if you're a creative, explore other mediums. Just because you're a photographer, don't just do photography. If you're a painter, just don't, don't just paint. Do other stuff where you get to stretch your creative muscles. This is something I figured out about eight years ago is that if I was sitting opposite my wife at dinner and the light was bouncing beautifully off her hair and there was some music playing and I got inspired, I felt this emotion, I would, imme I would immediately think to myself, okay, I'm a photographer, how do I translate this emotion into a photograph? I was limiting myself. What I, re what I realized is I should allow myself to allow that inspiration to manifest into whatever medium is best for it. So I started writing, I started writing poetry. I love poetry now, who would have thought? Uh, I got my, my first book of poetry coming out in uh, October this year. 
Um, and that poetry, as I started to explore poetry and writing, that fed back into my, um, into my photography because it started to explore areas of narrative that I hadn't thought about that I could put into my fashion photography. So very important, try to, to release your shackles of whatever your job title is and do other stuff. Do montage, do paintings, do um, you know, pencil drawings, whatever it is, just try different stuff. Um, another thing is about this time, this, this, you might think of it as a scary time. It is an uncertain time, I'll agree with you. I think you have to remain positive because out of this, things will happen. Opportunities will arise. Now, things might not be the way they were before, which is why you have to think outside the box. Don't just keep doing what you were taught to do. Don't just keep doing what you think you were supposed to be doing or what the person from last generation is doing. That was last generation. That was six months ago. What are you going to do in the future? How are you going to make yourself jump out from the pack? You have to think about, first of all, you've got to think about what is the world going to be looking for after this, after this whole lockdown? A lot of people are going to be stuck inside their houses and they're going to be questioning themselves. You know, there's a lot of time for retrospect, for, for self-reflection. Like, who am I? What am I doing? Do I actually enjoy my job? You know, because we never have a chance to think and process stuff. And now all of a sudden we've been given all this time to really decide who are we as people? What are we gonna do moving forward? Are we gonna change? Are we gonna be different people? Um, and people might go through the closets and say, you know, after you've, been, after you've been watching Netflix for three weeks, you might say, right, I'm gonna clean up my house. And they might start looking through the closets and going, my God, I've got so much shit in here. And does all this stuff define me? I mean, is this who I am? It's like, why do I have a hundred pairs of shoes? Does a hundred pairs of shoes define who I am? Does it, does, does it, you know, make me a certain person? People are going to start changing their values. And I, I truly believe and I hope that the companies out there in the industry, in the fashion industry, as well as uh, elsewhere, are going to say, listen, let's slow down. Let's rethink everything let's reimagine our jobs and what is the purpose of our jobs and what is the purpose of our our, our, our our industry because people are going to be when they come out of this and they're starting to look at what to buy they may be looking for uh companies that reflect their own change of ethics so you'll notice like on social media now a lot of people are getting bashed because they're putting out the same old stuff every day right they're saying buy this buy that blah, blah. and people are like do you know what's going on you're tone deaf right now people are dying people are losing their jobs why are you still asking people to buy stuff they don't need so you really got to think about that how are you going to sort of position yourself and i think it gives us an opportunity to start thinking for good what is for good how are we going to make again going back to you what is your legacy going to be I think it's very, this is an amazing time to look forward to making your creativity a force for good. So, so there. Um, the last thing I will say is, um, the question I always get asked is, how do you be successful? How are you a successful creative? And the answer is simple. It's 95% hard work, 5% dumb luck. And just to illustrate that, I'll go back to what I said about me researching, researching, researching when I had no jobs. For example, I think two years into my career, I had three months off because I wasn't working and I was ready and I had all these ideas. I had like, you know, ideas after ideas after ideas, but nobody would shoot them with me. And then all of a sudden, Glenda Bailey from Harper's Bazaar America called me up and said, listen, we've got a reshoot to do. Patrick DeMarchelli just did the shoot of this actress. He can't, he's not available to reshoot it. We've got to shoot it on Tuesday next. Are you available? Do you have any ideas? And instead of me saying, uh, yes, I'm available. Uh, can I have like a week or so to come up with ideas? I emailed her back with like five ideas in 10 minutes. And she said, great, you got it. Choose this idea, boom, boom, boom. So that's what I say, that you've got to be ready for that dumb luck. When dumb luck strikes, you've got to be ready to pounce upon it. You've got to be so prepared, so ready, hit the ground running. Um, and that's it. So, um, Thank you very much. I don't know how to like, turn this stop to share now, right? Well, thank you so much, Alexi. I have to say that those are really, oh, sorry, my video. 
I have to say that those are really powerful and inspiring words of advice and um, that you're sharing with the students. And I think they are probably very appreciative of that kind of perspective that you offer. And just to sort of summarize a little bit of what you said is, I think what struck me uh, the most is just your honesty of your path to self-knowledge and really being able to articulate what you value and that that really is at the core of your success. Um, and not just your success, but also your happiness. And I think that that's a really important thing for I think our students who are really thinking about their career at the beginning to sort of integrate into their, into their path now. I also really think your um, courage to say no to things is a really powerful message to students because I think so often you have, you feel obligated, like you have to say yes to every opportunity, but if you know yourself and you know uh, what your limitations are or what you're really about, I think, as you say, other paths can open up for you that you maybe didn't necessarily realize at first. And so there's that courage of your convictions that you talk about, I think is really essential. And then just in this sort of about silence, I, I can't agree with you more in the opportunity to sort of step back. And I know that so many of the students right now are really busy having gone through midterms and they have a lot of projects on their plates. But I do think that there is something at this moment that, you know, there is a little hush um, in the air. And I think taking that time to just sort of step back is really an important part of the creative process. And research, I'm all about that. Finding new opportunities and genres of inspiration, uh, teaching art history. I can't be uh, a stronger advocate for actually looking at other works of art and other genres, but literature, history, science, um, all of these things. I mean, I think there's so many ways in which students can find uh, really uh, important inspiration for their for their projects. So thank you so much for, for all you. that you shared with everyone. So I'm going to turn it over now. Do we have some questions coming in? I've got some five questions here that popped up. I'm presuming these are the ones that... Uh... Yes, so we have... Um, so we have one from uh, Lyndon here that says, what are your thoughts on the ways in which photographers are interpreting photo shoots and creative work during the stay at home orders, such as FaceTime photo shoots and sort of how are people sort of approaching that? Um, so I, I always find it fascinating when people, um, and there's, there's been a lot of chatter about it and people are saying, this is just disgusting, this shouldn't be done, it's ridiculous, you know, this is the end of fashion editorials. I'm always the one who welcomes anything that evolves photography. Mm. And I always cite the same old thing is that when color photography came out, all the black and white photographers were like, this is just a phase, this is not art, this, this is disgusting, it's just too garish. We know that color photography stuck, stuck around and it became the thing. Um, when when photography was about these big box cameras on big stilts. And then all of a sudden, these, the miniature cameras came out where a family in the 1950s could take pictures by themselves or the 1940s. And they were taking images that were just of their family jumping around and they weren't these sort of staid, beautiful fashion photo photographs like this. And the photographers at the time said, this is the death of photography. There's no art anymore. People are just taking pictures of whatever. But that, those images that those families took informed and fed into fashion photography and photography as a whole. You know, people start in the fashion photography, instead of having this statuesque person in a still looking with a spotlight on her, all of a sudden they had people jumping and running and living. And they were replicating what, they'd, what people had started doing at home. So this, again, it's all about evolution of photography. When iPhones came out, when phone cameras, photographers were up in arms saying, oh, now everybody's a photographer. Yes, they are. So you better get your, get your game on. And, um, but again, it taught us different stuff. There's this, and so again, with this, it's uh, when somebody told me that they were gonna start doing stay at home um, FaceTime images, I thought this would be fantastic. It's something new that hasn't been done before. Let's see what it feeds us. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really fascinating to watch what photography in, the, in public can do. And I'll give you a really interesting example. I was shooting um, a cosmetic brand. 
and we were and they, this cosmetic brand does so many focus groups on what works and what doesn't because they're a global brand and we were shooting this girl like Gigi Hadid and Maybelline and we had to shoot a full length picture of her in the street um, and as we were all taught to do when you take a picture of somebody full length the camera, the person with the camera goes down to the floor and then shoots sort of slightly up to make them nice and long rather than shooting down and making them foreshortened. And the creative director said, no, 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 you gotta, you gotta stand up. And I was like, but she's gonna have short legs. And he goes, yeah, but we've done these focus groups. And so what's happened, which is really fascinating, is that in focus groups, when they show people a professionally full length taken shot, um, they, people feel tricked. They feel like they're being duped into um, buying something. And I asked why, and they asked the, the public, the, the focus groups, why? And what they figured, they figured out is that now everybody's got their phone and these have a super wide angle lens. And when you take a picture of your friend, you know, going to the prom or going out tonight, and they say, take a picture of my whole look, you don't go down the floor, you just take a picture up here. And so people's eyes are getting used to big head, small body smaller legs and so it's not even they're not even noticing anymore that's just real to them now that's what they're really like that's what they think their brain is starting to feel is real so as soon as they see a professional um, shot like that they feel aha that's publicity that's public uh, that's advertising so i'm trying to be sold something so now even the advertising photography is having to take that into account and take these funny angled pictures to be more in line with what a phone shows mm -hmm. that's really i think that's a very interesting side of, of how technology and our perception of the world shifts over time. But I also think it draws on a question of authenticity and what we think of as authentic. And that I think that's a real tension in the fashion industry. And even I've heard you talk about other stories about retouching in photographs. And I think this draws on a whole other question of ethics and photography that I think you have a, a very strong take on if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about that. Well, yeah, that's a sort of double-edged sword because with Photoshop, we went through, we, we photographers, we creators went through a, a slightly sort of delusions of being gods that we could just sort of shape everybody the way they would, you know, how, the, way we, the way the designers would have wanted the dress to fit. And, um, but very quickly, the public caught on. All of a sudden, they knew what Photoshop was and they understood that, hang on, you, there, were, there were some funny um, examples on like People magazine when the Kardashians first came into fame. And one of the Kardashians was on the cover and the Photoshop was so bad that you could see how they'd squelched her waist in. Mm -hmm. And people started, you know, so obviously that made the headlines and people started to get, uh, what's that thing on the app called? Um, uh, Facetune, Facetune is it? <laughs> Come on, sure, you got sure. it. <laughs> Sounds right. <laughs> uh, I think it's called Facetune. And so maybe people started retouching themselves. So on one hand, we creatives have to be more authentic to not put out this, this, um, this, this standard that cannot be met by any normal human. You know, we all have marks, we all have lines, we all have everything. I look at some of my work from eight years ago and I'm horrified by the amount of retouching that was done. And, and it's, not just, um, it's not just sort of taking out lines and making you know arms smaller or whatever it is it's also affecting skin colors um there was a shoot i did with lupita and there was actually the first shoot i did with her and she was looking at the screen she said i love the light you're using and said could you do me a huge favor when when you retouch in post-production can you not lighten my skin and i was like what do you mean lighten your skin and she said well people lighten my skin and I was like, that's ridiculous. That, that would be so noticeable if you did that. And so she showed me and I was like, that's crazy how you've done it. So then I went back into my own archives and I realized that I had given certain retouched files to the magazines or to the advertising people. But when it had gone through them onto the newsstands or onto the billboards, darker skinned girls had been made lighter. And so it was fascinating to go into this and see. So then of course, I'm an inquisitive monkey. So. I would talk to everybody in the industry. It's like, so why do you guys do that? Well, what have you noticed? Or why do you think people do that? And you start getting into the sort of the darker underbelly of the fashion industry or what we, what we put out into society. And that, that was a, one of the, the seeds of 
why I did my book Diverse Beauty was because every time I was asked to do a, um, uh, an editorial, they said, right, give us a list of 10 girls who you want to work with and we'll see who's available. So I'd give my list of 10 girls. And the first one, they'd say, oh, you know what? We love her so much, but she's, she's a little bit, little bit too dark for this story. You know, she's old, so we're going to get rid of her. And then this one, a bit too frizzy hair, too freckly, too, too this, too that. And you're left with the two or three Caucasian supermodels of the time. And I was like, this is ridiculous. How, why? And, and, you know, I always had this argument with people. I say that if an alien came down and looked at fashion magazines, they would think that beauty ranged from here to here. When actually, if you go out in the street, beauty is from here to here. There's so many different types of beauty. And so I did a book and that was, people were saying that, you know, you can't have certain, uh, certain looks in high fashion because it's just not the right thing. Um, and so we, I did this book where I was wanted to make as many different types and looks and body shapes and ethnicities and skin colors and hair types, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I wanted to do it in high fashion images to show people that it was possible, but not only to show people that it was possible, so they would start using these people, but also to show the reader, to, to allow them to see themselves in this high fashion image. That's what Lupita said in one of her speeches, is that when she was younger, she never felt beautiful. Mm. Until one day when this model, this Sudanese model called Alec Weck was suddenly in the pages of Vogue. And she saw somebody who had dark skin like her and Vogue was saying that she was beautiful. And Lupita suddenly felt validated. She's like, oh, I can be beautiful. And um, so I wanted every type of person, every type of beauty to see some page in my book and going, I love this image and this is me and I feel beautiful and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, no, I think, well, with that transition, um, I'm just gonna turn to the poll. So the winner of the, the poll will, will win one of your books, Diverse Beauty. So the question that came out as the, the winner has to do with the photo shoot with Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, Brad Pitt and Quentin Tarantino. So you'd like to elaborate on that story. We'd love to hear it. Yes, I'll tell you quickly about that story. And then just, I know we're not gonna get to the other questions, but I'll just tell people if uh, a lot of the questions I'm seeing here, if you go to my YouTube channel, there's lots of tutorials and interviews and stuff, and you can go and answer some of these questions that you're asking here about portfolios and stuff. Um, so yeah, Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad and Quentin. So that was the weirdest day because we were flying to LA from New York the night before and we got on the plane and you know, you usually take like 10 seconds on the runway to take off. And after about three seconds, the plane suddenly goes like this and starts nose diving into the thing. And the guy pulled on the accelerator and we went up like this and sort of practically did a flip. Everybody was freaking out on the plane and the, the pilot didn't say anything. He said, oh, that was a bit crazy. And then after about 10 minutes, he says, we're going to go back because we've got a bit of a problem. Turns out that some gust of wind had turned our plane like this, and this wing had hit a sign. So when we got off the plane, we saw this huge chunk out of the wing. So they said, we're going to get you onto another plane in three hours, um, which meant we would, have arrived in LA, we would have arrived in LA at about 1 a.m., and the shoot was starting at 9 a.m. Uh, of course, the plane didn't arrive, so... We were there, ended up being there the whole night. We got the, la the first plane in the morning after being awake all night long in JFK. We got to LAX, we, re we sprinted, sprinted, we, we sped to the, uh, the shoot and it was for Esquire magazine. Brad was already there in hair and makeup. Leo was coming, Quentin was talking to everybody. I was freaking out because we didn't have any chance to set up the lighting and stuff. But this is when stuff gets fun because when things go wrong, that's when people panic and you as a photographer start to have fun because you have to release one side of your brain and let the creative side just take over. You can't second guess yourself. Um, and also people can't say, oh, can we try this sitting down? Can we try this, you know, doing standing up in another different position? We had to get all the images done by lunchtime and I was late. So um, we were setting up this, uh, this, we found this amazing 60s uh, location in Beverly Hills because Quentin Tarantino had said, basically said, it has to be um, correct in terms of the, the date of everything in the shoot. Like the furniture has to be 1969. It can't be 68 or 70, it has to be 69. The car has to be 69, the, the, the cutlery, everything. So we, we had this amazing set designer who set up all this stuff. And, um, and it was amazing. So Brad just walks in. Brad is the coolest most gorgeous, ridiculously good-looking guy. I mean, I was even like, oh, how is that possible? 
everything he does is cool. And like I said to him, right, I swear, and I, I noticed that on shoot on in, in movies, he likes to eat things or he likes to play with stuff. Now that you've, I mean, you may know, know this already, but go through Brad Pitt's movies and see him eating in every scene. He's always, he's always chewing on something. And so even, but he always looks so cool. He can be chewing like the most disgusting hamburger and he looks cool. So I just say, so go and sit over there. I've given you some records to play with in the glass and everything. You picked up a glass and you sort of say, and just everything is like uber cool and everybody, all the girls are melting. And um, so uh, we did, we, we got great shots of him and I was very quick. I'm a very quick photographer. I know when I've got it because I don't, I don't want to waste people's energy and I don't want to sort of say, yeah, I think we got it. I'm not sure because that's, that just slows everything down and people get bored. And, um, and he was like, yeah, you got it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. And he goes, all right, let's do it. And so then he came on and then Leo came on and Leo is fascinating because he's very, pensive you could have like a hundred people going around because they had all the publicists and all the entourage and everything and he was just in the middle and he was just like and i said so i did and suddenly the camera broke down and that's when you have to make conversations i was like so i had a near uh, plane crash last night and he goes oh really so i told him the story and he was like hmm <laughs> and that was it <laughs> and then we took pictures and then quentin was amazing because quentin was so into every detail he was so interested in what lens i was using and how I was going to shoot it. And we were doing all these very cool angles. Like I looked up, I researched lots of 60s and 70s men's magazines. And there was all this sort of wide angle from like shooting from the floor, like a worm's eye view or looking really down on them. And so we got some incredible shots. We finished by one o'clock and, uh, and, um, and it was amazing. And that's kind of the story. That's great. I love it. So just for all of the students, they were out of time, unfortunately, and we didn't have a chance to get to all of your great questions. But as Alexi said, he has some amazing content on YouTube, on your, uh, through your website. You've also been posting a lot of advice on a series about being in quarantine and being a creative in quarantine. So you should check those out as well. But I just want to say thank you so much, Alexi, for, for joining us here today. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, stay tuned for more guests and gusto each week throughout the quarter. Next up, don't miss design strategist Julie Zhao this Thursday at 2 p.m. And we'll see you next time for guests and gusto. Thank you. Thanks.